Sippin' do say, boy, this ain't your daddy yet. He in the Cadillac, me, I'm in the Maybach. This ain't great. Welcome, everybody, to another uh, phenomenal episode of Cognac Corner. I'm your host, Marcus Boston, and today we have on a musician. I don't know if I said that right. Musician. Musician. A, a person that plays amazing instruments. <laughs> Uh, the lead guitarist of Dr. Javegas. Did I say that right? Dr. Javegas, yeah. Okay. I think I was close. Um, it's better than some people. Most people. <laughs> but what you're hearing is Ethan Jones. Hey. Ethan, thank you for making time to come get on the corner with me. Yeah, man. Thanks for having me over. Uh, I know. Uh, I, I know Ethan. We've been talking about this for a while. I know. And I always feel bad when like, I have a guest on before Ethan. And I know Ethan. We've been talking about getting <laughs> on weeks ago. And I was like, I gotta get Ethan on before I get any further down this down this road. And I'm so happy to have you down in uh, Big Buddha Studios. Yeah, man. Dropping an episode of uh, Calling Out Corner. So being that, so we're gonna start off with you being a lead guitarist. How did you get into? So music is clearly your passion. Yeah. Um, where did it start? With with my adventure into playing music. Or yeah, yeah. Just in general. Just in general. Yeah. Um. So. My family on my dad's side are all musicians. Dope. Like we all play something or sing, do whatever. Mm-hmm. And uh, my dad's a fantastic guitar player too. I didn't want to play guitar. I started playing saxophone in elementary school band. Mm-hmm. Did that all through high school and college, but uh, got really sick with like three different types of pneumonia. So yeah. I just was like in bed for like a month. But mm-hmm. I wanted to play, so I'm I happy you're alive. Yeah, man. Me too. Happy you're still here. Thanks. But uh, I just go steal my dad's guitar out of his guitar case downstairs and creep it upstairs in my room and started figuring out little lines and just started liking that a lot more and mm-hmm. could do more with it and I uh, started a band in high school as most long haired guitar playing kids do you know <laughs> and uh, I didn't want to have anybody else in my band it was just a three piece so I started uh-huh. singing and then that kind of turned into what I do for a living now so well, that's, it's that's cool I met a lot of cool people along the way that's the part that I, I admire, like being is being in music and having a skill set. You know, it's like a trade. You, it's yours forever. No one can ever take it away from you. Yeah. And there's always places uh, you meet people on the way, and you build and destroy things. Um, like in high school, were you like in a band too? Uh, oh yeah. yeah, yeah. I was like the the drum major of the marching band, so I was like the king of the band nerds. For real, <laughs> did like all the musicals, uh-huh. all the, any band or music thing that was going on in. I'm from Granite City, Illinois. Okay, so anything that was going on, period, I was there. Yeah. It had to be. But uh, yeah, I had a, a band. We were called the Day After Yesterday. That's not bad. That's that's, not, that's a pretty good name. We were like, you know, three white kids playing Parliament, <laughs> shit like that. Like as a three piece, like it. It was cool, I guess, uh-huh. but it was cool to us, and that's right. what mattered. Right. You, know? you guys are ahead of your time. That's all. Trying it to ready. be. It wasn't ready. It was cool. So, what's, what's your, who's your, I guess, favorite, who did you idolize growing up as a, like, music-wise? Uh, that's a, that's a tough one. Well, the, the, uh, musician that really turned me on to playing guitar in the first place was Stevie Ray Vaughan. Mm-hmm. I heard that, and. It was like instant. I have to be able to do that somehow. I have to sound like that. I got to figure that out. You know, they're grown men, you know, like 60 years old that were trying to figure that out when he came on the scene and still yeah. can't do it. I mean, that's who he is. But um, just harnessing that emotion and uh, like when you listen to him do like Little Wing or like Life by the Drop or any other songs in his entire catalog, he's just a force of nature when you mm-hmm. listen to him. Especially as a blues guitarist, and uh, in the Soulard community in downtown St. Louis, as a, as a blues town, you yeah, know, uh, that was pretty readily accessible to go watch or listen to and see other people play that music and, mm-hmm. and do that. But he was the first one, and uh, I mean, my dad was a, a huge influence on me. Yeah, growing up, you know, watching him, I remember going to see. I would hear him practice songs. And then I would go see with him the musicians that he was practicing, mm-hmm. and I'd hear them doing. I'm like, that's not how it goes because Dad plays it right. Like, <laughs> that's all. That's all wrong. <laughs> and I didn't know. I was like six years old. Yeah. Like just trying to play video games with these dudes when they're like before the show. Right. 
He's like, my dad's better than you. <laughs> like, my dad will beat up your dad. <laughs> <laughs> you know? Have you and your dad ever played like together? Oh yeah, all yeah. the time, all the time. We were in a band. Uh, we were in Well Hungarians for about a year or so, and we do uh, acoustic stuff all over town. Oh, that's you know, dope. On the Illinois side, yeah, do about two or three a month. Oh yeah. well, shit, that's, that's that's good stuff. I you know, that was how dad do stuff with. It's jealous. It's a it's a neat thing, man. It's a really neat thing that, uh, you know, even if he wasn't like my father, like he is still a really cool musician to play with because yeah. we just bounce off each other and kind of get it, mm-hmm. you know, and that's, uh, that's something you can't really buy. You yeah. ha- either have that chemistry with people or you don't. Mm-hmm. What genre do you guys normally play? Oh. Or does it just depends on the gig or? You know, it, uh. If you wanted to call it anything, like, even though I played in Doctors of Vegas, I love country music. Mm-hmm. So we do like a lot of the older, older country music and some of the uh, singer songwriter genre, like James Taylor or uh, Jim Croce, Little River Band, um, the America, the Eagles, mm-hmm. stuff like that. Um, some classic rock tunes, but mm-hmm. it's acoustic, so it comes off a little more convincing. And what's cool about that. When you listen to like the these big rock songs or whatever, most of the time they're either written with a keyboard or on an acoustic guitar, and then they're produced into something with more grandeur. And mm-hmm. It's it's kind of cool just to think that maybe you're doing it the way that they did when they wrote yeah. it. Go through those same steps and processes and stuff. Yeah, you write a lot too. I do, I do. I uh, I had a record out. What is it? Six, six years now, six or seven years, mm-hmm. six, six years, and uh, I write and do some side projects with other people, and play on their records or mm-hmm. write my own parts or if they have a couple lines, I can get started and just bounce stuff off with them. I had a publishing deal and moved to Nashville for about two years, mm-hmm. and uh, that was really cool. I wrote for some. Uh, for a big name person, I don't want to drop names because that's that's lame. Uh huh. James Taylor told me, "Don't ever name drop." Like <laughs> we were hanging out, you know, <laughs> just casually. <laughs> Not cool to be a name dropper, man. Don't be don't, that guy. Don't be that guy, right? Don't be. The, what What inspires your 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 <clears throat> writing? Where do you get your inspiration from? What inspires my writing? Uh, people. Actually, mm-hmm. I think a lot of really good songs are written about people. Have you seen the uh, the Bruce Springsteen documentary or the the thing that's on Netflix? Um, I have like not watched. Li- I've seen it live on Broadway. Check it out. Okay. So he, uh, without giving too much away, he talks about his writing process and he writes songs about other people that mm-hmm. he's really close to, like his dad or friends that he grew up with or his friends that went to Vietnam mm-hmm. and like. How he does that is really cool because you can get caught up sometimes writing songs about yourself and everybody knows it, mm-hmm. and then you're a really harsh critic about yourself, yeah. and that's it's kind of like kind of a head fuck, honestly. <laughs> like you, like you, uh, you get in this fight with yourself, and then you don't necessarily want to finish the song, and it kind of scares you. So if if you can find something else to write about, um whether like a friend or a situation that's going on or something that you saw on TV Mm -hmm. or that you read about, it's a little easier to make that and weave that tapestry with words. Yeah. So so probably thinking like maybe if we write about yourself, it might be hard to choose what to include and what to not include because you don't want to give away too much or is it just because it's so personal, it's hard to to complete? Depends Uh, on what the... The yes. essence of the song is. Well, yes and no. I mean, I've written some songs that are that are pretty deep, mm-hmm. but um, the songs that uh, like I'm kind of a not necessarily a reclusive person, but mm-hmm. I keep a lot of stuff pretty close to the chest. Yeah. I mean, I'll, I'm an open book, but there's like I don't want you, I don't want everybody to know this part exactly of me because this know? is mine. Right. Yeah, I gotta gotta keep something to myself. Ah, fully understandable. So, hundred uh, percent. Yeah, it's. It's a little more difficult to uh, keep it like really personal, mm-hmm. 
because you don't want to like spill your guts and like be the Taylor Swift or something, you know? <laughs> like teardrops on my guitar. Like maybe, maybe that's maybe that's where I'm missing out. Maybe mm-hmm. that's my lane that I need to get in. This, this crack. Do, do you think pain or joy inspires the best songs? I just, I just it depends. I I really think it depends on what you want to say. Mm-hmm. I mean, like they they come out differently, right? I've written happy songs that sound super sad, mm-hmm. and the opposite. Like, yeah, it, I don't know. I I think it's whatever you are trying to get across to the listener. Yeah, because that's that's your end game anyway. If if nobody wants to listen to your song, you will not be successful. Right. Period. It doesn't matter how good you are if, mm-hmm. if nobody wants to invest that you know three minutes and thirty seconds into what you have to say. Mm-hmm. You usually get about. 30 to 45 seconds before anybody really cares. Yeah. It's like, you know, if you hear like like a, a beat on a rap song and you don't like it within 30, 45 seconds, you're like, no, nope, no. Nope. Moving on. Yeah. If you don't hook you to the next 30, yeah. Yeah, it's, it's a rap. That's, that's the hook. You've got to keep them there. Mm-hmm. How was, uh like, growing up, young, high school, early 20s, how was dating in, like, What's the dating like? I had DJ Socks on, mm-hmm. and he and he liked me like you know being a DJ and being self employed. How difficult that is dating like I'm self employed. I'm a DJ. I meet you on a site. You already lose your attention with me because you think of a DJ being this slut puppy and a bunch of options. So I'm like, okay, I never thought about that. It, He's that- totally right. <laughs> <laughs> He's exactly right. It's like sometimes I just don't want to even tell people what I do. It's like, what do you? I work at a guitar shop. Uh huh. <laughs> they, don't, they don't take you serious no no and that's uh another thing too like with musicians and djs people don't realize all the other work they only see like you on stage or mm-hmm. think they're like oh this is the coolest freaking job ever well it is a cool job but they don't take into account that you know you might have to drive six hours and you know live in a hotel room for five days mm-hmm. and you know the stuff that comes along with what you do, it's a lot of work. I mean, right. the, the practice time that you put in, um, just like anything else, like yeah. it's, this is your showcase. You know, the show is for other people and you also, but they just think that it's all fun and games and it's, it's a lot of work. If you don't put the work in, then you suck. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> Period. <laughs> if you don't, th- you don't shoot them uh, shots in practice, the game is going to show. Yeah. And uh, on the subject of dating, like when I, first decided to really play music for a living and make it my job Mm -hmm. um you know girls didn't take me seriously Mm -hmm. people didn't take me seriously but Mm -hmm. um i took me seriously and uh you know dating is is still kind of hard now because uh i guess i put off this weird intimidating vibe like and I guess I learned from dating that's like, you know, I, I just know this isn't going to work out because yeah. you think that I'm this person and you know damn well that I'm not. Right. And I I could just see it way down the line. Like, yeah. this isn't for you. Oh, you're an asshole. No. I just don't have time for what, it, not you necessarily, but what you're doing. Yeah. That, I don't have time for that. <laughs> like, you're just going to get in the way. And then. Yeah. It's a snowball effect of like, what do you mean? I'm not good enough for you. I didn't say that, but you just keep, here we go. Here doing we go. This dance I know this dance. Like just block. <laughs> <laughs> Left on red, block. So what's been your longest relationship while being a committed and practicing, trying to, you know, working on your craft uh, musician? I, I think I'm special. I can't get this word out. <laughs> you know, I haven't... Uh, I haven't had like a super serious relationship because I guess the longest one is a little over a year Mm -hmm. and uh, it it turned into when I just said, it's like, well, who's that? Who, like, how Mm. do you know this? But it's like, really? Like, haven't we been through this enough? Yeah. Yeah. You you know who I am. You know, I'm not messing around on you. Like I'm loyal. I'm faithful. Give it up. Come when, on. Once you're in, you're in. And I'm right. Keep questioning right. Right. my commitment. Yeah. But, um, yeah, like a little over a year and a half. It, it was cool. She was really supportive for like, you know, eight months of it. 
Uh-huh. And then it was like, I guess like the rose colored glasses came off and like yeah. everything just was like, well, look, well, you're out doing this and you're around all these people and I don't like that. It's like, okay, well, this is what I do. And and I wonder, I wonder, <clears throat> do they get used, they, they so used to, like they work nine to five, so used to having this schedule. When, when uh-huh. you work for yourself, they don't understand, like I'm never really off work. Like right. work is all day, every day. And so I can't be at a party or a whatever when you're chilling on the weekends that's when I work. Right. And you right. know, with building the podcast and just sort of the time that goes into this and everything else, like when you want to kick it on weekends it's Friday, Friday nights, that's when I make my money. Or that's when right. I'm doing what I gotta do, so I can't be there. Right. You know, and like when I think about <coughs> Cecil and his girlfriend, like why they work so well, they're in the same industry. Mm-hmm. So you understand that they work differently, so they have to make time on a Tuesday, Thursday, whatever, to make it work. And no one's like, "Oh, you're not here." Well, you know, I'm not living the traditional nine to five. I'm out here making it. If I don't make it, it don't get made. Right. Exactly. Yeah. So I definitely, um, I, I agree, and it's it's really hard. Like people, like they, they be like, said she was in for eight months. Then, like, I think it was a point of her seeing her friends doing the the cookie cutter relationship stuff on a schedule where yeah. she got envious and sort of back channeled that into you not understanding why she felt that way. Yeah. And the crazy thing is that she was a bartender too oh, and on a business. And I'm like, we do the same thing. How yeah. do, like, how do you not get this? Oh like, shit. So <laughs> if anyone understand, I think it'd be you. Yeah. Yeah. And that's why I was like, this is just, if we ain't got it figured out yet. Yeah, it ain't got it right out. If we ain't got it by now. We gonna get it. <laughs> no, that's, that's the advice. So how is, so what, when you need a place of peace, what music do you sort of um, gravitate towards? Uh, you know, I listen to classical music, and mm-hmm. I'm a big James Taylor fan. Mm-hmm. Um, listening to James Taylor records is kind of like records is how I learned how to play guitar. So um, I really like his songwriting. I mm-hmm. think he has a lot of really good things to say. Um, and I listen to classical music. Uh, Chopin, I like him a lot, mm-hmm. and uh, it's just a little more cerebral to me. Um, you can kind of close your eyes and, and see colors a little bit, and, yeah. Like employ your imagination, you feel the energy, yeah, and just maybe it's different every time, but you can uh, just use your imagination and get something different out of it every time that you listen. It allows you to enjoy. You can enjoy the moment. You know, yeah. yeah. You can be. You can. You can almost be in the room and. And you can really get in touch with your humanity through the vibrations of the music. Totally. Yeah, that's dope. That's dope. I mean, I'm, I'm assuming you have groupies because I mean, being your lead guitarist, you got the look. You, you know, you work. You with what's it say, Doctor Javegas? Doctor Javegas. Yes. So, like, how do you? What's your, so? What's your approach? Are you more of a like a say? You see them out, and you sort of like go for it, or you sort of wait and wait and get a filler out, or like, is there a lot of groupies? I mean, I'm saying they gotta be groupies. You gotta be loyal. No, no. Okay, no, you well, know you I, that argument. Thank I you. I keep to I keep to myself because, <laughs> like I said, sometimes it just don't have time for all that shit. Mm-hmm. <laughs> so. It's definitely a, um, an act of sport to be yeah. out here dating and yeah, so forth and so on. Um, but I guess, like, you know, I'll, I'll be doing a gig. I'm like, oh, that, that girl's pretty cute. Yeah. You know, you flirt a little bit, whatever. But it's, uh, I try to see how they act and just, like, is this something that I would be interested in maybe pursuing or, like, at least mm-hmm. introducing myself to her? Like, yeah. Or, you know, just people in general. Like, are you acting a fool? Do I want you in my camp or not? Like, right. Because the, the picking the wrong one can, picking the wrong woman can really, Take a lot of things the wrong way real fast. There are wars that are started over that, and, and plenty of <laughs> <laughs> plenty of great men been taken down by all the wrong women. Right. Click fast in a heartbeat. With breakups, like how does like what's your breakup approach? Like when you know it's coming to an end, and you need to get out of dodge. What's your approach to it? Uh. That's a tough one, man. Um, I mean, there, there, there have been good and bad breakups in my right. life. Um, I'll give you an example of the the good breakup. So she was an actress, like musical theater, mm-hmm. and was wanting to go to New York, and travel all over, and I was wanting to do the same thing. But you know, I had to get my feet wet playing music here, and right. started getting more invested in that. 
and it just wasn't going to work out. Like, yeah. So she went to college uh, up north and was from northern Illinois. Mm -hmm. And, you know, long distance on top of everything it else. Works. It was like, you know, like, we're going to be friends after yeah. this. And now, like, she's married now, and I'm still really good friends with her whole family. Yeah. Like, they send me a Christmas card still. Oh. So it's like, anytime I'm up there, they all come out to my show. Yeah. Like, this is cool. Like That's good. So, I mean, like, we're still pretty tight. But the bad breakup um, is, uh, well, I guess, you know, like, Long distance or like any type of distance, I guess is a good thing. It does thing not for work. Me. Well, I it. I'll get to that. Okay. So I was dating another chick um, when I lived in Nashville, and we kind of had a scuffle, and uh, I was gonna go down there and surprise her because I had some work to do. Also, so when I got down there, like we were still arguing, and I'm like, I'm just gonna go do my work, and I'm gonna show up at her place, and. See what's going on. So when I got there, some dude walks out of her apartment with Get the fuck out with of our dog. Oh, yeah, and I was like, oh, 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 oh. So that's, a, that's that's a little that's like what? That, so there's a line. That was that was a that was a bad way to. And that, at that point, it was like I'm not even gonna. Yeah. See you later. Like I'm not even gonna bother with this. You're Stuff just now. cut off. So she was like. Going through my family, like talking to my sister, my mom. Oh no! I'm like, just stay away from everybody. Uh, uh, just go away. So yeah. I, that hurt too, because like you know we were gonna like have a, a really solid run at it, and then yeah. to find out that I, I mean, how long has that been going? Right, on? you gotta be pretty motherfucking comfortable to walking with a goddamn dog. Right, my I, dog. <laughs> my mother. Oh yeah, you. I mean, I don't have dog, but I've been with girls that does and i it was walking dogs and shit i'm like for me to walk your dog on on my off day on my lunch i must really like you yeah i really i'm not i don't have one so i'm like i'm doing shit out of my comfort zone to, for you to be comfortable yeah. when i walk up in this motherfucker and some man got my dog <laughs> man you like i got you like i love yeah. my life enough not to ruin it yeah damn that's deep yeah it sucked i couldn't type away now it wasn't my damn dog <laughs> <sighs> what kind of, what kind of women do you like like what's your I know you're open to, you know, all kind of ladies. You don't discriminate, but you have a preference, as we all do. Mm -hmm. all, what, so what's your ideal? My, I, like. Like physically, and then personality that best um, works with you. Um, I, you know, honestly, I, I'm not attracted to blonde women. Me neither. I don't. I like dark hair. I, I think it's because I dated a blonde chick one time, and everybody thought that they're like, "Oh, you're out with your sister? Like, uh, what are you talking about? See? This is weird." No, <laughs> no, no. So like the opposite of like me. Like I prefer a, a girl to be shorter than me, mm -hmm. and maybe it's just like a psychological thing. Like yeah. not necessarily uh, like dominance, but it's like a, a, like an instinctive like protective thing. Yeah. Like, it, yeah, I don't. I don't know. It's just. It's just the man thing. It's the protective. You want to. Yeah. You want. You want to. You want to be the man. Yeah. 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 That's understandable. Um, and it, I like people that are creative, mm -hmm. and kind of the same way as me, like a little bit more reserved. Mm -hmm. Um, but can have conversations with people. Absolutely. Like, I don't like a homebody person. Necessarily. It wouldn't work because you you're out and about with people, even though you're low key you still engage in the world yeah i mean you there's know? a there's a time and a place for it like yep. but uh you know sometimes it's good to just be at home and keep to yourself and you know if you're out it's no fun just to go sit in a corner and be you know by yourself and yeah hide, hide from everybody that's that's no fun yeah and i don't like people that uh are needy like that have to like uh thrive off of compliments like they oh, need yeah. that that positive or not even positive just like that affirmation like mm -hmm. that, like you're just there like you got to hold them by the hand oh yeah like, i can't i hate that I don't, who got time for that I don't, I that's, that. that's a huge insecurity issue with that, that person and i'm not here to i'm not here to fix you that fixing you is up on you now i can might give you a different perspective or another angle to approach something you're aware of but like for you to be thinking that I am here to repair you, that's not unfair. Unfair to me. I'll never be good enough to fix you because I don't, I don't know what you're not telling me. 
and my approach to fixing me might be different than what you might need. Right. And that's just such a a, a blanket of insecurity. Mm-hmm. You know, like if you're always on the mend, then you're not really doing anything right. Yeah. It's like, well, do this, but but I don't like the way that you did that. Well, what do I need to do? I don't know. Oh, I hate that. I don't like this. So what do you like? I don't know. Then shut up. If you don't have a better solution, <clears throat> shut the fuck up. Oh, and another thing. Uh, I like a woman who knows what she wants to eat when you ask her. Oh, man. Oh, my God. Oh, yes. <clears throat> <laughs> oh, my God. That is the worst, isn't it? Yeah, absolutely. Ugh. You want to eat? I don't know. Okay, yeah. let's get sushi. What do you want? I don't want that. Then go home. Yeah. Then, I'll, then, what, then what are you eating? You know what? I'm not doing this. Yeah. That's, that says a lot. That says a real a lot about that. About that. I think. I mean the the, the road to the road to comfort. Like like what is let's say uh, you meet someone. What, what's a deal breaker for you? Like what is your your early stage deal breaker when you meet somebody? So they, they fit. The, let's say the physical stuff you're into and you guys vibing, what would be a deal breaker early on? You'd be like, you know what, maybe I can't get over that. I mean, what would be something that maybe a conversation could get you past? Like, is kids a deal breaker? No. Yeah. It's really hard to have. It's really, that's, a, that's a hard one to have because, like, who don't, almost who don't have one. On that subject, um, if if she does have kids and she's out all the time, Mm-hmm. And like, and she uses her kids as an excuse. And it's like, well, you can't really do that. I think that's just total bullshit. Yeah, um, I, I hate that. Like having kids doesn't bother me. I do have a problem with uh, them introducing kids. Like just from what I've seen from other people. Yeah. Um, like introducing the kid and like immediately evol- involving child in xyz person's life yeah that ain't cool because then you're just like you're messing with the guy's head right you know like it it was kind of that way for me actually yeah. um the girl that i dated had a had a three-year-old daughter and um the first time that i like met the kid it wasn't like this is my boyfriend or like this is blah 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 like mm-hmm. this is i'm not the new dad no yeah. But like, just got to like be around the kid, and you know, I got you get attached. Yeah, I got feelings for that, and I, I don't think I could do that again unless I was really that's we in it for the really long committed. Long. Yeah, yeah, because you because you get a, you you stay longer in relationship with her because you're thinking about the welfare of the kid more than she is. Right, and that's not fair to any person. No one involved, involved. not at all. Now I understand with that. So mm-hmm. I definitely know when I, when I meet women that have children. And they're like, you know, I have kids. Like, I don't need to meet them no time soon. Yeah. Because I, res- I mean, I don't have children. You don't, you don't have any. You don't no. have any either. So it's like, you know, when you meet single mothers, which are a lot of women we meet, that's fine. I know. Just let me let, tell me where I fit in to your schedule. You know what I'm saying? Right. Like, once again, like when I'm, when you're available, I'm probably working, but mm-hmm. we make time for things you want to do. You know, and then I get it. I got to come in late at night. I got to be, go- be gone for wake up. I get it. It's cool. Just like, you know, just I respect your life choices and situations you've entered. And I want you to respect mine when I can't always be there when you want me to because I'm doing what I enjoy. Yeah. And I don't be the usual nine to five clock. So I'm definitely a root that. So what's your like philosophy on music? Like, what what's your, your approach to it? Like what are the, the things you sort of govern your music creation process to, and then how does that does that mirror maybe your flow toward relationships? Or are they totally? It should, I mean, I would think they're intertwined. The most things I think are somehow stitched together. Yeah. Uh. So my philosophy on music and my creative process. So I'm naturally a curious person. Mm-hmm. Um. So. Like a my philosophy on that is to be able to. Well, I've got a couple different ones. So as a as a performer, um, and like a studio musician, I feel that it's necessary for you to be able to you know cover all the bases. Mm-hmm. If somebody calls me up to do a jazz gig or to do an acoustic thing or a country gig or you know a rock thing, mm-hmm. then 
you have to be able to adapt and kind of be a chameleon at that yeah. point and do it convincingly well uh, to where it doesn't sound like, you know, me trying to play slap bass. I mean, I can play bass, but I'm not like John King good, if mm-hmm. you know who he is. Yeah. Like, I'm, I wouldn't dare, like, <laughs> take that take that gig. Like, I'll, I'll get the other guy on the phone. Like, yeah. Let me, let me do my thing over right. here. Um, but I, I think it's necessary to be able to adapt to any situation musically uh, for a creative process you i mean you have to be honest with yourself like if like if i wanted to start rapping or something mm-hmm. it would come off so stupid because i don't like i listen to that stuff i can like i have rhythm enough to do that yeah but i it, it's just not me it's not it wouldn't be authentic. it would be f- just fake as hell mm-hmm. You'd be like what is this and it'll come across that way no but, um, I mean, you have to be honest and true to yourself. And a lot of people, um, you listen to, like, country music now, for example. Mm-hmm. It's the same thing over and over and over. And I'm sorry if anybody listens to this, likes country music. But it's literally, like, I listened to the radio for about 15 minutes. And it was the same tempo, the same key, the same chord progression for three songs straight. Mm-hmm. And I was like, is it even over? Like, is this yeah. the new free bird? Like, what's yeah. going on with this? But it's because people are uh, kind of chasing it. They're chasing what, what's in the now and how can I make it now. Yeah. And they're not um, – it, it's done without any sense of integrity as far as I'm concerned. Yeah. They're, they're, the, the business side has got too big. And, I mean, I, clearly, I don't know the music industry that well, but as a consumer, and just sort of reading things and watching stuff, like the people that make decisions on what we hear are not true to the culture of the music. They're making business decisions. Yeah. And to where the artists are sort of limited to the music they probably want to release, they can't because the person that's in charge and cutting the checks said, well, we don't want that. We want what's selling right, and what's easily packaged and what's microwavable instead of like yes, releasing the music you actually believe in. And there's, you know, it might not be, it might be ahead of its time. It might be a different lane, but like at least it's genuine and the people that need to gravitate towards it will enjoy it yeah. and let it. Because, like, hip-hop the same way. If you listen to hip-hop stations, like, the same damn tone, the same conversation about nothing, there is no variety in... The beats might be amazing, but the content is horrible. Yeah. And it's all the same. Like, this is the same sound like the last person that said, I got a Bugatti and a Rolex or AP. Like, give me that same conversation in a different way, and I might give you another round. But, like, right. you are the same thing. Yeah, I agree. I agree. But, yeah, I, th- I think, uh, you know, chasing chasing success in that regard is a you know it could be the path of least resistance mm-hmm. but it's the also the quickest way out too. right there's no longevity yeah. in it and i think um and r and and like the you know music used to be a slow cooked meal you know it takes some time and you wouldn't hear from an artist for two years but when he drops oh man this is something i, I can repeat over and over and like get yeah. attached to with being that music is so much um so available and the upside is that it, it the the entry door or the gatekeepers are lessened you know because now i can just drop on soundcloud i can sort of build my own community but on the flip side um every everyone can get in and everyone shouldn't be here mm-hmm. so now it's a consumer like what who how do i find something that sort of speaks to me and I can hold on to and grow with, but then the same breath, like I don't have time to be going through a thousand different right. new artists and songs to find my niche. So it's it's a double edged sword. as all things are. So like, which is the uh, which is the which is the best way? Um, you know, like I, it's dope being able to go to my streaming service and you know help. I, I think curators are. I think really curators are really dope. Like you know, I enjoy going to Apple and they sort of give you new artists and new music or all their curate music you have based on your listening habits. Mm-hmm. So now, like, oh, I never thought about, oh, this might be something that I wouldn't have not found because I don't have the time to yeah. spend digging through crates because right. I'm living life. But, like, thank you for helping me curate and figure out some things I wouldn't have run across. Sure. You know, because I just don't have the time. But then in the same breath, I'm missing out on something that I don't have the time. Yeah. You know, some, the new, best, greatest thing that might speak to my growth is out there, but I don't have the time to find it. So where is right. that middle ground and it's just a, it's just the hard thing in the business itself you know like when i post things on instagram for the show you get a lot of 
you know, uh, like CEOs of record labels or all these different musical avenues that don't even feel offended. Like, I'm not a musical act, so why are you ask me to DM, DM you and you're, you're it's the bots. You know, I guess it's the bots yeah. that use a certain hashtag and automatically responds <laughs> to see if you're the next great little pump or whatever little little you're going to be. Right. Make what you're going to make, and then I'm off to find the new one, not trying to give you the slow... Mariah Carey longevity of any artist. Like who's who's the I think of the last artist that's been here for a while that's grown within the genre that's still you can say, Oh man, I remember I was in high school and he's grown with me. Mm-hmm. He was just like, All right, I'm here now, I'm gonna get burnt out, then I gotta find something new. Like, I, I want you to grow with me. Or certain rappers get stuck in their they become caricatures of themselves. They get afraid to grow because their audience is so used to talk about Codeine and baby mamas, and like, well, no longer on Codeine. Huh? <laughs> Got a wife now, but I'm forced to make the music out of fear that I'm gonna lose my audience. So, you know, like, it's unfortunate. But then we have an example of what it looks like to grow in hip hop or grow mm-hmm. in your genre. It's like looking at Jay has grown as the adult. You know, he yeah. his music. When you have talent, your talent is gonna be talent regardless. You can't be afraid to share the story. Like, you're not selling rocks no more. You're selling paintings. So let me hear right. how you wanna. Deliver that and just let it be what it is. Mm-hmm. Everyone can't make it into the club. Right. So it's okay. But I'm going to keep growing with or without you. And you yeah. find different ways to uh, satisfy your creativity. So, yeah, I guess that's the. And you know. I guess that's the other thing, too. Like, you can't please everybody. You can't. No. It, it's like, you know, you're not David Hasselhoff. You can't save everybody. <laughs> like, you got to give it up. Like, you, you've got people that are invested in what you do. You have, like, a a fan base and it goes back to just being true to yourself Mm -hmm. like if like if that's who you were like just leave that who you were yeah like uh like john mayer did this crazy record where he was like out in montana for two years i said what the fuck and he was like this cow like he lost me the born the born and free album and shit yeah i was like bro where's my john mayer at please like like, i mean it was some of it was cool but i'm like uh what are you doing what are you doing john so that was after the Battlefield of Love album, I think he came out a year or two later, or one uh, of Battle Studies. Battle Studies, yeah, Fa- great album. Yeah, I, that was probably the last one I bought from John. Then he came out and said, "I can't relate to this wilderness type of lane." Yeah, it's like you're this like like freaking kid from Connecticut. Now you're this like cowboy. What the <laughs> hell? Like with a big old floppy hat. Like <laughs> like is this what you do now? It's like you just. Got consumed by the hip survive. Yeah, give it up, I, homie. I was like, "That's not the John I know." <laughs> no. I mean, I want you to grow and try new things, but like, at what at what cost? I'm like, "Well, maybe you'll come back." Well, he, well, he did come back a little bit, like the stuff that he did with uh, like Pino Palladino and Steve Jordan with the with the trio. Oh yeah, yeah, yeah. like uh, the record came out either last year or two years ago. Like the search for everything, mm-hmm. whatever it's called. That's cool. Like it's got some really cool like R and B. Like Al Green, yeah, tracks. yeah, that that's so R and B. Back when you had a whole a whole uh, studio full of musicians, and you may you hear it, and, and, and even even as I've grown, you go back and you listen to you know new R and B and how it's created to where like you know the Al Greens and the Bootsy Collins, like you can feel even in a digital form, you can still feel the difference in the music because you mm-hmm. can feel. The I- I- instrument being played, they're not just coming from a laptop and a track. Yeah, I mean, there's a there's a time and a place for that, but uh, here, here's another tip on the philosophy thing. I think uh, the hardest part about playing music is listening, or the hardest part about doing anything that's um, like in a band setting or just whatever. You have to you have to listen to uh, what you're doing, mm-hmm. and anybody that maybe has a suggestive thing like that's honestly one of the great things that i love about dr Vegas. not just the performing aspect of how we are as a unit um, but when we you know are kind of behind the scenes we're also the same unit like we don't you know break that stride we're mm-hmm. there to help each other out like like i said i write songs uh, frankie writes songs and my drummer paul is a, a like I won't say surprising because that sounds terrible, but he's a, <laughs> a he's a, a different type of guitar player. Like he just wanted to learn house, so we taught himself, and mm-hmm. he's got these crazy ideas yeah. that just work. And uh, we cut a record for him. We did 
I think, 16 songs in two days. Damn. Yeah. Like, we don't mess around. Yeah. Like, we, we're we in it until it's done or yeah. until we're just staring at the wall like, I gotta go home. Yeah. <clears throat> yeah. But we'll just play off of something or, like, I'll have a riff. And he's like, no, like, kind of, like, sleaze it up a little bit. I'm like, well, I'm. No, he's like, listen to this for a second. I don't know. They sound about half drunk. Take a shot. Do something. Yeah. Play like that. Like, yeah. all right, cool. Yeah. And, you know, we just make that happen. So uh, listening to, like, what's going on is pretty important. Yeah. Because you never know how that's going to, like, like what's going to rub on you. Right. You know, like, you know, you don't know what you're going to take from the situation until you at least try it out. Yeah, and that's the same thing that you say with being in the band and being a musician. <laughs> I don't think I want to put H in it, but musician. musician. Um, relationships, same way. When you listen to understand and not just to reply, you're going to do more, be more successful in it than not so. That being this romantic art, being friends, like listening, the reason you have two ears and one mouth. Yes. You know, and it's a active sport, not a spectator sport to listen. Mm-hmm. And you can tell when someone's actually listening and engaging and trying to process what you're saying or when someone trying to think about what to say back you know what i'm saying and because that's that's how you that's how you absorb stuff like you know think about him teaching himself to play guitar learning things yourself you aren't restricted by someone else's parameters of what the right the wrong way to do things you figure out what's best works for you and then you can better embody that individuality and creative streak in that instrument you know me yeah. learning how to what if it's editing or uh, present things is more successful because I'm not restricted to, oh, this is the way I'm supposed to play this record, or this is how I'm supposed mm-hmm. to play, or I should post this way, blah, blah, blah. Like, when you find things out your own and you're passionate about it, it sticks better, and then the consumer or the audience receives it better. It's more authentic, more engaging, yeah. and it lasts as long as you, it's, it re- you remember it. Would you say that's like a, the difference between listening and hearing something? Yes. Yeah, so. Yes. Because, like, when you're listening, <clears throat> you can oftentimes repeat it back, but in your own way. Mm-hmm. When you're hearing, you just going to pretty much summarize what you thought they said. Right. Yeah. That, that, that made sense to that. I just came up with that, too. That's good. Write, Write, that. Write, Write that, that down. down. <laughs> <laughs> Write that down. Take notes. Believe in it. Take notes. Take notes. Take notes. What kind of so like what what's been your best and worst date? My best and worst date. Yeah. <clears throat> um. Uh. Oh man. See this this sucks because I hate remembering all this shit. Isn't it amazing? <laughs> oh, like like it like it's in the past. It's like you move forward. It was like mm-hmm. best and worst date. Uh. Well. One of my favorite ones. Are we talking like a first date or just in general? Like, um, both. And then, like, well, let's have been on a blind date. Do people still do blind dates? Is that even a, is that even a thing Isn't anymore? That, I guess that's like the whole the whole Tinder thing. But is it you know, what? I've never had a Tinder date. Like, I had it. I tried to do like uh-huh. the the online thing. Yeah. And like, like everybody's going on these Tinder dates. It's like, what the hell? Like, I can't. <laughs> I'm so old school. I say, hey, I can't even get a text message back. I can't get a text back. You motherfucking stay because you because you you, you're creative. You're creating shit. The motherfuckers go to work nine to five, only work two hours out of eight hour day. Most of that they bullshit. I know because I've been that person. I've done. I've done. I've had more time for that stuff when I had a traditional day job. Because yeah, once you get used to, once you learn what you're doing at work. You know how to do it with the least amount. autopilot. Yeah. So you just like, my phone's on me. I'm going to be on Instagram. I'm going to be on this site, that site. Blah, blah, blah. Exactly. When you're creating shit, I don't have, I'm I'm missing about eight text messages right now and like four phone calls. Because you're busy creating stuff or thinking about creating stuff. So you don't have that time. Not tell you it's maybe late at night when they're sleeping. Because they got to work in the morning. Well, I'm up at three or four in the morning because I'm yeah. doing <laughs> what has to be done. And I'm thinking about the to-do list of things like, damn, I should have. I meant to do that shit. I meant to send an email. Blah, blah, blah. Like, well, you had to get up at six. I might be crawling to bed. And I'm getting up at noon saying, good morning. Right, <laughs> you know what I'm right. saying? So that's the hardest thing. Like, um, and I, I took over the whole question. So back to your dates. <laughs> <laughs> All right. So uh, let's let's just get the bad one out of the way. Yes. So, um, So 
I went to watch this watch this band with this girl. Like, I don't know why that always starts out that way. <laughs> but um, I uh, I got up to use the restroom. When I came back, she had a. I remember this. This is the I got roofied. You got roofied? I swear to God, got roofied. So I come back, and uh, she's like, "I don't really want this drink." It was like a like a vodka and sprite. Uh -huh. like, okay, I'll take it. So I'd only had maybe two beers, and I took this, and I got up out of the like off the stool, uh -huh. and just like fell. Poof. Couldn't stand up. Like didn't know how. I I don't even know how I got back home. I think I drove myself back Damn. home. Damn. Yeah, it was like just throwing up the whole way and. That was bad. I, I I don't know if she did it or this other guy did it because he was kind of laughing about it later mm -hmm. on. I'm like, well, I really hope you didn't do it. Damn, that was that was rough. That Fuck was real yeah. bad. Uh, that's terrifying. Felt terrible. Uh, mm -hmm. That's that was bad. Um, I could probably think of more bad days. That's, yeah, that's not. That's let's close that door. Oh, yeah, that's gone. Uh, the best one I went. It's kind of like a, like, you ever like bought somebody a, like a, like a Chris, this sounds terrible, but like <laughs> buy somebody a present, but you know that you're going to enjoy it too. Oh, hell yeah. All right. So I, uh, I bought us a present. <laughs> right. Like, like, <laughs> like whether you like it or not. Yeah. One of us going to enjoy it. <laughs> it's like, it's like, uh, this comedian said, like, my girlfriend asked me what I wanted for Christmas. I told her an Xbox. So, come Christmas, I open up my present, and it's this really thought out, thoughtful picture of us on our first date, which is cool, because I got her an Xbox. <laughs> <laughs> like, genius. <laughs> nailed genius. it. Genius. But uh, the best it. one, I went to uh, this concert to see a group called Dirty Loops. It mm -hmm. was at the Ready Room here in town. And yeah, Ready Room's on uh, <clears throat> Manchester. Yeah. Yeah. Really cool venue. And... I saw them, and that was probably one of the best concerts I've ever been to. It's like, mm -hmm. this is the coolest first date ever, because I don't really have to talk to you at all, and <laughs> hopefully you like this. Like, hey, this is cool. Yeah, yeah. this is really cool. Awesome. <laughs> uh -huh. I don't know how this is going to go, but right. cool. But yeah, that was cool. Uh, Yeah. I haven't had a whole lot of, like, bad dates. Yeah. Uh, because I usually think them out. Like, I, I guess I like to be scheduled and have everything kind of planned out. Yeah. For I, as much of a, like, fly-off-the-cuff guy that I am, mm -hmm. when it comes to things that I care about, I'm very structured. Right. Um, so, I usually think things out for a while before I execute on mm -hmm. that. It's like, what's your favorite restaurant? Like, find all this stuff out and just... Bam! There it is. Yeah, I'm like you're the coolest ever, right? Because because you, your time is valuable. We we when when the world when your world operates on your schedule, being that you're a creative, you take time. You don't take time for granted, right? You and know how it, important it is. Where you working on somebody else's clock nine to five, you take it for granted. Yeah, and I I try to inherit that thought for other people oh. too. Like I don't want to you know waste their time, right? And you know you know just ruin. You know, this segment of their life that they're never going to get back. I don't yeah. like, I don't want to waste their time and you know, my money or mm -hmm. what are my time for that. Yeah. Matter. Like let's have a good time. Right. So we don't have to deal with any of the other bullshit. And it doesn't mean that this is going to mean to be like, one of my favorite quotes is like, you know, I'm not mad that it's over. I'm happy that it happened. Right. You know, And I want to take what I, came from this moment because you might not be the one and i don't believe the one i think it's a whole stupid philosophy and it's almost like valentine's day and hallmark you know making the business of the right. human condition but uh i agree with that one. Yeah. you have to enjoy this moment because i might be the you have to like i realize with like relationships and find you know the love and the person that works the work the person that best fits you you gotta go through the bullshit you can't you need to be very patient mm -hmm. and wait <clears throat> and and hope that time does not expire before you find a person or you have to get in the fight and go through the bullshit and just deal with yeah. people that maybe you know you didn't need to be with, but you had to go through them to get to where you want to be. Right. And you ever been on like one of those dates where, where you just both know that the date totally sucks and you look at each other and 
acknowledge that. That sucked. You want to go do something else? Yeah. And yeah. just like, like we both know like, we're not going to do this like, again. Like part two. Like, yeah, that, nah, not, like, so, not so much. Are we splitting the bill? Yep. Because I'm not. Yep. I usually, if I, I feel like I'm, a, I'm a, if I'm making an investment, then I'll, because I, I got it. Don't worry about it. It's like, I'll I, just, I'll, yeah. Sigh, see you later. Yeah, we're not. Yeah, you're, you're really structured. You're really boring. But thank you for meeting me here. And I'm so glad I drank a lot because I'm going home and take a nap. <laughs> But this is. But thank you for showing out that you're extra boring. Yeah. And I don't see. I need to see a little bit. I like a little nasty in my in my women. Not obvious nasty, but I need to be able to see like, oh, she got some nasty in her soul. <laughs> when I don't deep down, <laughs> so yeah. I'm like she just need me to draw it out of it. And I, I don't, I don't have, I gotta reach too far. I can see it's right on the cusp. It's right, right within reach. Right. When I look like you look super. Con- Boring. I'm like, I don't know why you swiped on me because I don't know what made you think that I was gonna be boring as fuck, man. I, and just like bad dates in general, like when it comes to being boring, when chicks are just on their phone the whole uh, time. I wish the mother. I'm like, hey, hey, I'll get up and leave. Hell yeah! Like, you don't have to stay here. The my actually one of my favorite things is like a, to see how that goes. Is if like you're talking to somebody and clearly there's like some kind of a like a feeling thing going on. Mm-hmm. I hate when people have their phone like this, and as soon as they get a text or something, they put it away. Like, mm-hmm. I'm just trying to talk to you. Like, one yeah. look me in the face. I don't care about your fucking phone. Yeah. Like, leave that alone. Yeah. Like, what that, are you trying to hide? You that PTSD away from me. That's or, that. Or they're just doing this, and you're talking. Uh huh. Uh huh. Yeah. What? Uh huh. Uh huh. Yeah. Hey, if you don't want to be on. here, I can definitely <laughs> find a replacement. No. But <laughs> you get up and and leave and freak out. Uh-huh. That's that's the best. I love yeah, that. I'm gonna get out of here. Kind of like a like a poke, like <laughs> see what what happens. Like, <laughs> what is my? How much can you deal with? Where are you coming from? That little bit of little bit of mischief kind of mm-hmm. comes out of me. I'm like, I'm gonna mm-hmm. see how far I can push this one. The Cecil says that dark side shows up. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It's okay. But that's fun. It is, it needs to happen. Like we're we're not we're not a monolith. So like. You know, we have our dark side. It's just, once you or become aware of it, you're better able to handle it. Like I'm reading a book by uh, Robert Greene called "The Laws of Human Nature." Book thick as fuck. Like it's Bible thick. And his previous books, maybe because I got them in paperback, they didn't seem as thick. But like, but we talk about human beings and human nature. It should be this thick. Yeah, because. I think when you can really put some time in to, to invest yourself in a perspective on how humans operate and be better prepared to deal with them, you're able to better navigate them. It's like, you know, I like to say when you understand that people come in life for a reason, season, and lifetime, if you're able to interpret what that person is in your life for, you're better off. You know, yeah. don't get pregnant. Don't pregnant somebody that's here for a season and they're here for a lifetime. You can go through hell. You know? Yeah, it's weird because I, I said something incredibly similar just the other day. I was talking about people, and you mm-hmm. just kind of you kind of know, but it's um, like I don't, or at least I do. I, I don't know why. I try to not say that I'm a particularly good judge of character. Oh, I, I am a good fuck like, that. I am a good judge. <laughs> I will. I can judge a good motherfucking heartbeat like quickly. Yeah, I yeah. I mean, I just know, like, there's just something I don't like about you. Yeah. I don't know what it is, but yeah. I don't like you. Bitch, I ain't fucking with you. Like, yeah, like, no, I'm not feeling it, Mike. Yeah, like, Mm-mm. you're just something kind of yee. Like, <laughs> yeah, fuck yeah. No, own that shit, Ethan. Say, yes, you are a good judge. Good, I'm a, I'm a we good are judge naturally, um, I'm a good judge of character, Marcus. You got them right. Yeah. You got them right. I am, too, because I'm a good person. Like, I'm fucked that. I'm going to say I'm a good person. I have good character. So, meaning that I know what, how I come across the people. And I've grown and how I treat people all the time the best way as possible. I, I want to approach everyone with respect and empathy first and foremost. Yeah. Do I always deliver that all the time? Probably not. But at the end of the day, I think I do. Yeah. And being that you know where I come from, I know how to see that in others. Especially when we see them multiple times in different environments and they're still the same person, good or bad. Okay, I'm good. Like I know, oh, yeah, he ain't shit. Oh, she ain't. No, oh, okay, she has. She might be a good person, but I don't have the. I don't have the time to dig it out of her. Right. And and I don't think she would dig with me. She thinks she want people like she want people where, like she wants me to fix her. She'll dig with you, but she'll hand you the shovel. Right. My hello, <laughs> motherfucker. This is your shit. I'm good. <laughs> right. 
<laughs> they want to be like, no, seeing you missed the spot. <laughs> seeing this. This is, <laughs> this exactly. is digging with both hands. <laughs> both hands. By myself on your problems. I'm good. I'm I'm fine. I, I didn't give you no self for my shit. I know my, my I got a backhoe. Boop, boop. <laughs> I got to dig up a damn grave or a body. Yeah, very true. I don't know what we were talking about. Uh, I don't know. We were talking about, um, damn. I think the do say kicked in. I didn't. <laughs> I lost my train of thought. We were, we were talking about bad dates, and somehow we ended up with I, I, shoveling shit, shoveling shit, shoveling, shit and, shoveling, and good people. And we both know, we both know, we're both good judge of characters. I like dogs because we're both good people. I mean, I like dogs. People that, that don't like dogs piss me off and freak me out. True. I like. I don't. Mm. I've never. I've never owned a dog. Um, I definitely would like to own one. Correctly, I want to be. I make sure I'm in the right <clears throat> place in my life to properly respect and give the dog a right. proper home and attention. Right. Knowing that I'm not there and bring one to my life would be unfair. Right. You know. But I'm just saying, like, if I showed you a picture of a, like a cute dog, uh-huh. you're like, oh, look at that dog. <laughs> but people that are like, I don't like dogs. Oh yeah, you can't be trusted. Like, no, you need to go away. Yeah. I know this girl. She's like, I have two dogs. You're going to be nice to my dogs. I'm like, I'm not going to be an asshole. I'm not, I respect your dogs. I'm just not. Fuck, yeah. fuck you, dog. <laughs> I'm like, get the fuck away from me. Put the. No, I'm like, hey, I'll, <laughs> I'm chill. The dog's chill. We, we have no problem. I'm not going to be like, I'm not going to lose my mind. I hate people that lose their mind. Like, stop. And, like, come on now. Like, eat. I'm walking in with my dog. Like, you could acknowledge it, but don't, don't like make me stop and want to take in my car. Relax. Let my dog live. He's chilling. Yeah. Let him be chill. Like, when people over. This is my problem. If people overvalue dogs' lives over humans, then we have a now we have a problem. Yeah, because you know, yeah, I understand human beings. It's because I think in that in that kind of logic, you like the control aspect of of dealing with dogs because they're sort of dependent on the human being to where a person is a human being, so it might not be as able to control it. You know what I'm saying? So you can't you shouldn't they both have equal they both have value but the level of value is not quite equal in human life i want to say a little bit more useful properly uh loved and nurtured i mean dog the, a dog is not gonna find the cure for cancer but it's, he's not gonna i mean but it's but it's cool to be like hey man i'm carrying yeah. cancer and petting the dog <laughs> check this <laughs> out dog you don't care but all right. <laughs> There's a value. I'm like, oh, she's doing the most, but then you treat a you treat a dog great, but humans bad. Like that makes no sense. Maybe you should treat them both equally, at least respectable and emp- empathetic. Yeah, empathetic and you know, re- respect. You can't go wrong with respect. It's listening, <clears throat> to, listening to uh, understand, not to reply, and respect goes a long way. Then as as always, a quick. Return on investment, no. <coughs> but as a long term philosophy, you win every time. Then yeah. com- you know they're coming off as whatever. I think the other night, what was it? I don't know what that was. Like you see the guy that gets want to be tough guy with security. I'm like, who are you? Why are you acting like a whole asshole? Like, it's not it, gonna end well. It's not <laughs> gonna end well. Like, like, what do you? Then the girlfriend want to get to it too. I said what. I said, okay, I gotta go because I don't understand. All he asked you was, "It's time to go." You put your hands on me, meet me outside. Okay, y'all, y'all must forget. Y'all, why do y'all not think that every like you? So you, you don't, you don't value your life, huh? It's like, it's like, did you forget that my job is to be here to kick your ass? <laughs> right, and like, <laughs> if you get out of line, I'm supposed to kick your ass. The problem not, the problem uh, not what that you see me is who you don't see. You think I'm just here, one guy by myself at this establishment. I'm not the crazy one. The part you should worry about the person you're not seeing right now is going to fuck you up. Yeah. Tough guy. Yeah. Shit baffles me. Okay, Ethan. That's, 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 we're going to close on sharing some uh, gems. So, what would your advice, Jim, would be for a up-and-coming musician that's passionate about what they want to do? How should they approach um, um, expanding their exposure or, you know, just sort of develop themselves um, in the music? What would you? What would your advice be? What would your gems be? The the hardest part, uh, I think, for a lot of up and comers, like uh, we'll talk like teenagers, mm-hmm. like uh, if any kids from like the school of rock, pardon my language, for the <laughs> podcast kids, but um, just it, I guess anybody that uh, is like practicing or wants to write songs is 
just be open to advice and you mm. you've got to you got to learn how to take criticism and be okay with criticism because it's not always a bad thing people yeah. um just automatically assume that it's it's terrible and they're not doing a good job or they're never going to get it you have to you have to be patient you have to just take what you can get mm-hmm. and go from there you have to just you know kind of dodge the bugs and see what you want to do at the end of the tunnel mm-hmm. Um, Frank actually made a really good thing. He's like, this is where we're going, but you're like driving a motorcycle like 100 miles an hour, and you're just trying to dodge all the bugs and anything else that's coming at you, mm-hmm. and try to get out of the way. It's all good, bad, or indifferent, you mm-hmm. know, but you have to be open to uh, somebody saying, I just don't like what you do. Yeah, it's It's not the end of the world. It's like okay, well, what what would you like for me to do? Mm-hmm. Um, you don't necessarily have to go that way, but be open to the thought. Yeah. Like what we were talking about, like just the being multifaceted. Yeah, you know, be able to maybe switch gears or see what it is, but be true to yourself. And uh, that's such a cliche thing to say. Yeah. Like, be true to yourself, man. But it's almost like, but I mean, it's so true. Like. Honestly, right. like you have to, you have to be okay with what you're doing. But, mm-hmm. um, where am I going? Be like, be okay with what you're doing. But if you if you screw up, it's not the end of the world. Yeah, be patient. I guess is is the hardest the hardest thing to do for uh for people that are hands on and want to, you know, deliver something. If they're really serious about it, they'll figure it out. Yeah, it's almost like you know being being a creative and creating music, you know, it's a very personal thing, but almost don't take it too personal. Like don't take the criticism personal. We know yeah. it's your baby. We know you have a vision and you know, you're really attached to it, but be open to someone else giving you a perspective or an angle that you can't, that you didn't see. Like, you know, when people come and maybe give criticisms or advice about the podcast and stuff, I'm like, I'm open to it. Cause I, I don't know everything. Right. I don't know what I don't know till I know it. Mm-hmm. So if you can take a listen or see something that I can do better, I'm like, oh, you're right. Let me write it down and get back to it and figure out a way to incorporate it to a way I can be consistent with that advice. Mm-hmm. I can't be like, no, I know we'll do podcasting and I'm good. Like, no, I, we don't know shit. So if right. you know something we don't know for sure, and the same vice versa, if I can help you, you know, give a perspective or angle that you might have thought of being, you know, a creative pursuit or just in relationships, I'm going to give it. Yeah, and you see how many people you know had a run in with a friend, and she hit you with those Facebook tirades of, you know, I put my heart out to people and blah blah blah. I'm like, look, you're a horrible judge of character. You keep picking the same people in different hats. How about you? And she when she hit me with the, well, I see the best in people. No, you don't. <laughs> no, you don't. You see what you want to see in people, right? I see. I see before they are. I, I, I'm coming in that you are you as good as you are bad now. Right. The point is, which one do you lean on more? Mm-hmm. And can you own your bad side? So every, it's not saying everyone's guilty to prove innocent, but like I, you're, you're a human being. So I mean, you're inconsistent and paradoxical. Got it. But there's a choice to be made along that way. And the point is, how how willing are you to be to engage in conversation about your flaws and your triumphs? Says yeah. a lot about you and your character. And when you can't, you can't even have. The conversation about you being self-deprecating, like, oh, I'm just stupid. Like, look, I'm done. I, I can't. I can't have a conversation to even enlighten you because you are already saying how bad you are. Like, you're not listening, Linda. Right. Listen, Linda. <laughs> look it. You know, it, it's a, uh, what I'll say, it, it kind of correlates with, with music and with relationships, too. Um, like, with practicing. Like, mm-hmm. I see a lot of, uh, a lot of guitar players or drummers or just musicians in general that will sit and play what they're good at and consider it practicing. It's like, all right, we already know you can do that. Mm -hmm. Like you're not, you're not making yourself any better. Like you have to suck. Like you have to sound terrible. Mm -hmm. And when that becomes better, find something else like to, to work on. Yeah. Like, and I think that's uh, important when it comes to people too. Like Mm -hmm. if you know what you're good at, you don't, you don't have to necessarily always uh, like, use your strengths like you play your strengths sure mm-hmm. but like you need to employ your your weaknesses too because you don't know how that's gonna like if you're shy maybe go talk to somebody yeah or 
kind of lean into a conversation and yeah. you don't have to like like be a total extrovert yeah you know and go like hey everybody I'm coming up right. i don't know like yeah like, you're gonna be elton john every night right you can just you know it's like with me i know like i have a not like not like 70s elton john but like lion king elton john <laughs> Not the rocket man, just be uh, not, not crocodile rock, but like the circle of life guy. <laughs> be there, be him, right? And it was a town <laughs> that was everything, nothing all in one. Get it, dude? So I saw Elton actually, and it was it was awesome because I I do that voice jokingly, but like when he did, there's something about the, the way he looked tonight. <laughs> he was like. Man, I can't explain. <laughs> something about the way. I was like, yeah. <laughs> hey, my brother. He's like almost like if if Cher was actually a dude. Uh huh. <laughs> Cher just, was just like a man. Just, just, I mean, Cher has a, a man voice. God bless that woman. But yes. But like. Like, that's, like, Cher could totally do the Lion King soundtrack, and it would be seamless. You never know the difference. Let's, let's, let's put that out. Let's see if Cher will do it. This is available. The, ne- the new one, the live action one's coming up. Is it? Yeah. It's got, like, Beyonce, it's Nala, and, like, uh, um, what's the what's the guy, uh, Childish Cambino, what's his name, uh, what's his real name? Dan- uh, Daniel Glover is, uh, Daniel Glover. Donald. No, Donald. Damn it. I'm sorry. I'm Damn Glover. it, Donald. Not Daniel. Daniel Glover is from Lethal Weapon. I didn't right. Donald Glover, uh, is I think is uh Simba, and then really? you still have uh James Earl Jones as Mufasa, uh, what? So yeah, they Nala's Beyonce. That's that's coming up. This I think it's coming up this summer. The trailer just dropped. I want to say either end of last year. I think December. I think around Christmas the trailer yeah. dropped. So I think it comes out this summer. New, the new Lion King live action. Right. That'll be still- a, that'll be a gem. Will be a bunch of thirty something year olds in the theater with. With all the other kids that are like, either their kids sucks. or their nieces and nephews. Shut or, up! Yeah, if you haven't seen the original one, you shouldn't. You shouldn't be allowed to see the live action. It's levels right. of this shit. Right, right. One thing for another. If you didn't spend time with like the plastic VHS Fuck dog, the what was it, the blue diamond or black diamond? Yes. Yeah, I had them all. My auntie would buy me and my sister all of those. We had like. You remember the big ass like the cases that we just oh, bought? This? Yeah. Oh, we had every cut we had, your fingers. And- yeah, we had every Disney movie, them big plastic ass cases. We and had it wouldn't them close, and you had to like move like real quick. Uh huh. Like, yeah. We had all that shit. That shit's great. That's some shit you can't that, that know a, about. That is a gem right there. Yeah, that's, that's a gem. Sh- a a gemery. That was furniture. You had to play in your house. Like, where do we fit these big ass these big ass VHS uh, storage cases in this house? And you had the big, uh, so you had like the big st- st- stereo cases with the speakers and the di- CD changer. The whole, uh, they don't understand <clears> the struggle. <throat> they don't respect. It. Now they have these fucking Alexa plays. Get the fuck out of here. Back in, <laughs> back in my day, we had a whole system. Yeah. But you was winning. You had the whole stereo system on, behind the glass. We the had CD changer we had phones on cords too. Ah, oh, shit. Little heathens. These sons of bitches. <laughs> we had house phones. You hoes. <laughs> I'm sorry. I love you guys. Sorry. I'm right. on the whole old man tirade. Sorry. Sorry. Even if you hoes have house phones, you're still. What? 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 Anything else you want to drop on the audience, our connoisseurs, before we wrap up for this episode? Uh, I think it's episode 11. 11 of the Kanye. 11. Album. That's appropriate. Like, we've got the, the Marshall thing here. Mm-hmm. Like, the spinal tap goes to 11. Mm hmm. Yeah. Um, Anything else that I want to drop on? Any gems? Any relationship gems besides just you know listen to uh, whatever? Okay, I'll li- yeah, go ahead. Uh, any other gems about relationships? Uh, if you don't know, don't do it. <laughs> <laughs> if you can't own it, don't do it. Right there, you go. If you can't own the choice, don't don't do it. Ain't nothing worse than fucking excuses. I don't know, no, no. no. Excuse, you chose to do it. Excuse. Oh, Everybody's got a fucking excuse too. There's always an excuse. I was just excuse. It's okay not knowing too. Like I don't know. I'm sorry. Yeah. Just. It's easy to own it. Just own it. If you can't do it, if you can't own it, don't do it. Yeah. Learn to just say no. Just say no. Yeah. The thing. Yeah. Say no. If you don't want to do some no. shit, say no. That's important. Say no. <laughs> 
and stand on that now. Okay. Right. Well, oh, everyone, uh, that was Ethan Jones. Was our guest for episode eleven of Cognac Corner. Thanks we definitely appreciate me. him. Oh shit, Ethan! I'm sorry, but Ethan, keep talking. I gotta give you some sound effects. I'm gonna get my sound effects, boy. I should have had this shit oh, earlier. Man, I say every episode I'm gonna get better at this. I keep lying. Like, I had a good. It's been a while. Wait, wait, sorry. Ethan, Ethan. Yeah. You wanna hey, thank yeah. Ethan Jones for coming into Cognac Corner. I hope you had a good time. Yeah, man, that was I'm, a great I'm, time. This is cool. Like, like I could do this all the time. Just talk shit. Hey, we can get you on. Uh, we'll get you with C- me, you and Cecil. Get on one. Get you on the two audience, and we can uh, take this conversation to another rabbit hole that we never know where it's going until it goes there. Maybe I'll bring my guitar next time or something. Oh shit, we getting fancy, sons oh, of bitches. We bring, we we, we, gonna, we got the house musician. I'm gonna get. That, I'm gonna practice that word so next time I can say it without saying like I'm on the. Uh, I'm a short bus with a helmet. My exotic last name. <laughs> this is exotic last name, Mr. Jones here. <laughs> <laughs> that was funny. <laughs> I'm gonna write that one down in my journal. How do you say your exotic last name? <laughs> Jones. <laughs> wow. I'm gonna get my life together, you have to promise. <sighs> so that's another Me round too. of applause for Ethan. Hey, hey thanks everybody. Ethan thanks Jones. Thank you. Hey. Oh, what's your socials? What's your Instagram and Twitter? Oh, um, yeah, Instagram uh, at Ethan Jones Music. Same for Snapchat. You can find me on Facebook at Ethan Jones. So yeah, you can spell my name. Yeah, I'll I'll have all his promo, all his uh socials in uh, the clips and stuff, so you guys can find find him and follow his music, um, <laughs> and other good stuff. Um, well, once again, I'm gonna thank Ethan Jones. <laughs> you just can't even say my name anymore without laughing. <laughs> That's a thing, though. <laughs> <laughs> All right. <laughs> All right, guys. Um, I am Marcus Boston. This has been episode 11 of Cognac Corner. As usual, love yourself, love each other. Only thing we have is time, so use it wisely. Good night. Peace. Marcus, Hey, how you, how you doing?